The great tradition of the English novel has provided the 20th century film and television industry with some magnificent storylines and on occasion huge box office success. Authors such as Jane Austen, who were often little known in their own time, have become posthumous celebrities and, rather than diminishing the public's appetite for the classic novel, demand has increased. This, however, is not the case for the subject of this programme, George Eliot. In her own time, George Eliot was one of the most famous and well-paid of all writers, and on one occasion in 1862, a leading publisher offered £10,000 for her next novel, Sight Unseen. To put this into context, when Charlotte Bronte, at the height of her fame, published Villette in 1853, she was paid £500. Of George Eliot's contemporaries, only Charles Dickens was more financially successful, making him one of the most widely read and popular writers of all time. Charlotte Bronte may not have achieved the same literary acclaim and financial remuneration in her own day, but for the majority of modern readers, she and her sister Emily are far better known today than George Eliot. Beyond the fact that George Eliot was not a man, as her pseudonym suggests, comparatively little is known about Midlands-born Marion Evans, whose great literary achievement as George Eliot earned her respect at every level of Victorian society. It's fortunate for the world of literature that fashions change and the public's taste in reading often brings about a resurgence in the popularity of overlooked authors. And for George Eliot, the end of the 20th century is seeing just such a trend revitalising interest in her magnificent works. The novels of George Eliot are full of surprises and can certainly shock the modern reader. Her own life was equally as controversial as her work, with the places and people that inspired her having their own story to tell, inevitably within the pages of her novels. The Mill on the Floss, which is perhaps the best known, tells a story based on George Eliot's own Midlands childhood. The quality of the writing is exceptional, full of emotion and atmosphere, as this early extract describing nine-year-old Maggie Tulliver displays. Maggie loved to linger in the great spaces of the mill and often came out with her black hair powdered to soft whiteness that made her dark eyes flash out with new fire. The resolute din, the unresting motion of the great stones, giving her a dim, delicious awe as the presence of an uncontrollable force. The meal forever pouring, pouring. The fine white powder softening all surfaces and making the very spider nets look like a fairy lacework. The sweet, pure scent of the meal all helped to make Maggie feel that the mill was a little world apart from her outside everyday life. All of the successful novels, Adam Bede, The Mill on the Floss, Silas Marner, Middlemarch and Daniel Deronda have their roots in the Midlands landscape of George Eliot's childhood, which began in Warwickshire in 1819. She was born Mary Ann Evans on the 22nd of November here at South Farm near Arbury Hall, where her father, Robert, was estate manager for the Newdegate family. Robert Evans had two children by his first wife, who had died in 1809, and a daughter Chrissy and son Isaac by his second wife, Christiana, Mary Ann's mother. When Mary Ann was only four months old, the family moved to Griff House at Chilvers Cotton, just a few miles from South Farm. It's now called the Griff House Hotel which at first glance appears like a modern building, but if you walk around to the back, you'll find the original front of the house, as it was when the Evans family arrived in 1820. 
Marianne was a rather serious and extremely plain little girl who was much closer to her father than her mother. She also had a very close bond with her brother Isaac, who she looked up to from a very early age. When Mary Ann was just five, she joined her sister Chrissy at boarding school in Attleborough and proved to be a clever child, reading Bunyan, Defoe and Goldsmith. Sir Walter Scott became a great favourite and after reading part of his novel, Waverley, at the age of seven, Mary Ann wrote a completion of the story for herself. The next school she attended was in Nuneaton, where she became a pupil of Maria Lewis, a devoutly evangelical Anglican who would remain influential even when at 13, Mary Ann moved to Miss Franklin's school at Coventry. It was by no means automatic for girls to receive such a good educational grounding in the early 19th century and Mary Ann Evans certainly took full advantage of what was offered, becoming accomplished in French, music, English composition and literature. When Mary Ann was 16, she returned home to Griff House when her mother, Christiana, became gravely ill. Mrs Evans died in February 1836. It was a slow, painful death and despite their lack of closeness, it must have been a harrowing experience. Mary Ann's strong religious faith, bordering upon the obsessive, became increasingly puritanical as she remained at home to keep house for her father. Teachers from Coventry visited Griff to help Mary Ann continue her education and she also had the added benefit of use of the library at Arbury Hall which provided a wonderful supply of academic material. Intensive study of religion and church history found her taking private lessons in Italian and German, but Latin she taught herself. Mary Ann Evans, at this stage in her development, was an intense, good young woman. And when her father retired from his work here at Arbury Hall in 1841 and moved to Coventry, he could not have foreseen the dramatic effect that this new location would have on his rather pious daughter. Isaac remained at Griff due to his forthcoming marriage. Once settled at Foss Hill Coventry, Mary Ann soon came into contact with a group of free-thinking radicals who were becoming prominent in the town. Robert Evans, by political persuasion a conservative, was troubled by his daughter's new friends. Earlier reading of new works of science and poetry had already started to open Mary Ann's intelligent mind to a world beyond religion. So meeting with the engaging Charles Bray and his wife Caroline allowed her to discuss advanced philosophy, socialism and Christianity without constraint. Mary Ann's changing views saw her leave behind the evangelical ideals of her youth to broaden her horizons. This caused some difficulty between father and daughter when Mary Ann decided that her new beliefs made it hypocritical for her to attend church with Robert, beginning 1842 with a refusal to accompany him on the first Sunday in January. The ensuing row resulted in Mary Ann moving back to Griff to stay with Isaac and his family. It took five months before a compromise was reached and Mary Ann returned to Coventry after agreeing to resume church attendance with her father. Her integrity was however preserved as it was acknowledged that this was only for the sake of appearances. Mary Ann's association with the Brays grew, often introducing her into wider society. When she attended the wedding of Caroline's brother Charles to Rufa Brabant in London, she was invited by the bride's father, Dr. Robert Brabant, to visit his home in Devizes. Although Dr. Brabant was in his 60s and Mary Ann was 40 years his junior, she became emotionally infatuated with him. The situation was somewhat embarrassing. 
Dr. Brabant was evidently fond of the intellectually fascinating Mary Ann, calling her his second daughter, but his wife became suspicious. The amorous attentions of this undeniably plain young houseguest directed at her husband must have seriously unnerved Mrs. Brabant because Mary Ann was abruptly sent back to Coventry. It's interesting to note that the good doctor's wife was in fact blind and it was her sister's report of the infatuation that resulted in Mary Ann's departure. She was evidently able to observe what Mrs. Brabant could not. Ironically, it was the Brabant's daughter, Rufa, who asked Mary Ann to take on the task of translating D.F. Strauss's Das Leben Jesu, The Life of Christ, a project that she was finding rather too demanding. It was a huge task, taking two years to complete before publication in three volumes by John Chapman. The anonymous translator was paid the grand sum of £20 for all her hours of laborious work, but it was the start of George Eliot's professional writing career. The Brays continued to influence Mary Ann, providing her with friendship and great intellectual stimulation. Although writing was her main interest, Mary Ann also did some teaching until her father's health started to fail. Robert Evans died on the 31st of May 1849 and despite their obvious political and religious differences she wrote What shall I be without my father? It will seem as if part of my moral nature were gone. Shortly after this the Brays took Mary Anne on her first trip abroad visiting France, Italy and Switzerland. On her return, Chapman sought out the translator of Strauss, asking for a review of another work he had just published. Not only did she accept the commission, but when completed, she delivered it to Chapman in person. If she wanted to make a success of a writing career, then London was the place to be. So after shortening her name to Marianne Evans, she moved into Chapman's boarding house, 142 The Strand. The publisher had offered to help her in the search for work and in return she read manuscripts for him. Chapman was a strikingly handsome man and a notorious philanderer married to a woman some years his senior. At this time his mistress also lived at 142 The Strand as governess to the Chapman children. A close relationship developed between Marion and Chapman, with him spending time in her room to listen to her playing the piano. Susanna Chapman was suspicious and had a piano put into the drawing room so that she could keep an eye on her husband. Thwarted, Marianne started to teach Chapman German, which gave them an excuse to be alone, but this was short-lived because the mistress decided that she would like to learn German too. With both women obviously jealous of Marion and possibly with very good reason, a conspiracy between the two saw Marion sent back to Coventry in May 1851 after being caught holding hands with Chapman. In that same month, Chapman bought the Westminster Review, which had been established as a journal for philosophical radicals. Marion's talents made her an ideal contributor and over the next few months Chapman travelled regularly to Coventry, soon appointing her as the publication's editor. Chapman successfully negotiated Marianne's return with the ladies of the house and by the September she moved back in with them to run the periodical anonymously. This really put Marion Evans at the centre of literary society and she came into contact with some fascinating writers. Her romantic interest in Chapman was soon transferred to Herbert Spencer, the editor of The Economist, who accompanied her out and about in London. Spencer described Marion as being the most admirable woman mentally he had ever met. Many, including Marion, expected an offer of marriage, but when Spencer realised the great love he had inspired, he became very uncomfortable. Spencer described her as being too morbidly intellectual to marry and explained to Marion that for him there would never be anything beyond friendship. 
Spencer remained a frequent visitor to the Chapman household and was often accompanied by George Lewis, a friend and fellow contributor to the Westminster Review. Despite being described as the ugliest man in London, Lewis was a lively, intelligent, popular man and he quickly developed a close friendship with Marion. Friendship blossomed into love and as discretion was desirable, Marion moved from 142 The Strand to more private accommodation. George Lewis was married and equally as complex a character as the previous objects of Marion's desire. Agnes Lewis, his wife, with whom he had three sons, was no longer recognised as such because of her adultery with Lewis's publishing partner, Thornton Hunt. There was definitely a cooperation between all parties because Lewis gave his name to the children born to Agnes and Hunt. Helpful as this may have been, it did make divorce virtually impossible because in the eyes of the law, Lewis had condoned his wife's adultery. Although this was all something of a setback for Marion, having finally found a man who returned her feelings, she had no intention of losing him for the sake of social mores. George Lewis was lively and open-minded, with this introduction by a friend painting him as the life and soul of the party. He is the best mimic in the world and full of famous stories and no spleen or envy, no bad thing in him, so see that you receive him with open arms in spite of his immense ugliness. Marion wanted to live with Lewis forming a union that was a marriage in all but name. Unlike Charlotte Bronte's heroine Jane Eyre, who Marion admired in many ways, being with the man she loved was the most important issue, whatever the social consequences. However, Marion had obviously learnt much from the incident where she had refused to attend church with her father. Total disclosure of her intentions had caused all manner of problems, so on this occasion, she kept her thoughts to herself. This was possible because on the 20th of July, 1854, Marion Evans and George Lewis left for Germany to set up home together, giving friends and relatives as few details as possible. Marion resigned her post with the Westminster Review, characteristically committed, but Lewis was perhaps more cautious, treating the whole adventure as more of an experiment. Whatever his view at the outset, life in Germany with Marion was extremely enjoyable. It was unfortunate that by the time they moved to Berlin in the October, news of their liaison had reached family and friends back at home. Disapproval filtered back, even from those they considered to be fairly liberal-minded. When they returned to England in March 1855, this convinced Marion to remain in Dover, while Lewis went on to London to sort out his financial affairs. It was only when Agnes Lewis declared that she would never reunite with her husband and... She would be very glad if he could marry Miss Evans. ...that Marion joined him, taking temporary lodgings and insisting upon being called Mrs Lewis. Mr. and Mrs. Lewis settled in Richmond, the object of contemporary outrage. Marion received few visitors, becoming virtually isolated. And even though this was distressing, she put her time to good use. Chapman asked her for reviews, and for once in her life, she had nothing to lose by saying exactly what she thought, even accusing Dickens of encouraging the fallacy that high morality and refined sentiment can grow out of harsh social relations. She argued that there was a need for an English writer who would study English social classes realistically and reveal the pressures which accumulate and impede social progress. Fiction, she believed, had such a social function. George Lewis, astute in the extreme, suggested that Marion must try and write a story.
Marion turned to her childhood memories of the Warwickshire countryside to provide the inspiration for Scenes of Clerical Life, which she began in September 1856. In the November, Lewis submitted Marion's work to Blackwood's magazine for publication. In the fashion of the time, it was serialised anonymously, with John Blackwood addressing the unknown author as Amos Barton, the commonplace clergyman hero of one of the scenes. However, when Marion wrote to William Blackwood on the 4th of February 1857, she signed herself George Eliot for the first time. The choice of such a seemingly ordinary nom de plume can be explained in various ways with the benefit of hindsight. The French novelist George Sand was the pseudonym of Amadine Aurore Lucille Dupin, whose work George Eliot would have known, as well as taking an interest in the lady's unusual private life. If George was a compliment to Miss Sand, on a more straightforward note, it could equally have been in honour of her own beloved Louis. As for the Eliot, it has been hypothesised that Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre might have been influential. When Jane runs away from Mr Rochester, having discovered that despite his love for her, he is already married, she chooses to conceal her identity as Jane Eliot. There are, of course, times when hindsight generates theories that are overcomplicated. An equally probable explanation could be a place called George Eliot's Close, marked on old maps of Chilvers Cotton, which, as a land agent, her father would have used. Scenes of Clerical Life was published as a book in 1858, and despite having to moderate her references to spitting and drunkenness at Blackwood's request, George Eliot felt her stories were realistic. As a reviewer herself, George Eliot had a thorough understanding of critical appraisal, but she couldn't have asked for a better review than the one that appeared in The Times on the 2nd of January 1858. The reviewer likened her work to Goldsmith, Crabbe, Lockhart and Sir Walter Scott, an excellent start for any writer's reputation. George Eliot built upon this success and when her first novel, Adam Bede, was published in 1859, it attracted serious and enthusiastic acclaim. Translations followed in several languages, including Russian. Tolstoy was deeply impressed by the novel when he read it in October 1859. Praise indeed for Adam's creator. The plot for Adam Bede can be attributed to a story told to George Eliot by her Aunt Elizabeth, who was a Methodist preacher. In 1802, the good aunt visited Nottingham Jail to hear the confession of Mary Vos, a girl convicted of child murder, before accompanying her to the gallows, where she was hanged. This may well have struck a familiar chord with George Eliot, as Sir Walter Scott's Heart of Midlothian tells the story of Effie Deans imprisoned on a charge of child murder. Unlike Aunt Elizabeth's sad tale, the outcome of Scott's story is far more satisfactory, with the child, Effie is accused of murdering, turning up alive to clear Effie's name. There are four main protagonists playing out their roles in an apparently simple pastoral. Adam Bede, the dignified young village carpenter, who owes many of his fine qualities to Robert Evans, falls in love with pretty, vain and self-centred country girl Hetty Sorrel. Contrasting with Hetty's flightiness is her steady down-to-earth cousin, Dinah Morris, a Methodist preacher. Dinah is a gentle and wise character who does her best to guide Hetty, concerned that the young girl's flirtatious nature can only lead to trouble. Sadly, Hetty is so convinced of her own powers of attraction that she sets her sights on the local squire, Arthur Donnithorne, who seduces her. Hetty, with her limited intelligence, truly believes that Arthur will marry her, but when he predictably leaves her, she agrees to marry Adam, who has always loved her. Hetty discovers she is pregnant with Arthur's child and runs away. 
George Eliot's description of Hetty's despair is one of the finest tellings of this all too familiar story to be found in the English language. She must wander on and on and wait for a lower depth of despair to give her courage. Perhaps death would come to her, for she was getting less able to bear the weariness. Poor wandering Hetty, with the rounded childish face and hard, unloving, despairing soul looking out of it, with the narrow thoughts, no room in them for any sorrows but her own, and tasting that sorrow with the more intense bitterness. Hetty Sorrell is, without doubt, responsible for the death of her baby, and although modern social workers would be more understanding than the authorities in George Eliot's day, her actions could carry no lesser charge than manslaughter. But murder is the charge for Hetty, and she faces jail, a trial and a death sentence. Although the story of Hetty Sorrell contains great social morality, George Eliot shows a degree of sympathy for the unfortunate girl, as well as allowing Adam and the other inhabitants of Hayslope to eventually return to the natural order of country life. Adam Bede was not just a critical success. Much to Blackwood's and George Eliot's delight, it went through eight printings within a year. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were said to have read Adam Bede aloud to each other with great admiration. The publisher rewarded the author by doubling the £800 fee he had paid for it and also by returning the copyright. The references to the Warwickshire countryside alerted certain of Marion's acquaintances to question whether George Eliot was in fact her. When Marion informed the family in Warwickshire of her unusual marriage to Lewis, her brother Isaac had been horrified at such scandalous behaviour. Despite the resulting estrangement, it was Isaac who had recognised Marion's pseudonym with certainty, and so she let it be known that she was the author of Adam Bede. Once her identity had been revealed and reconciliation with Isaac and the family looked impossible, Marion was free to include personal details in her writing. The novel which followed in 1860, The Mill on the Floss, tells the story of a devoted brother and sister who become estranged when she fell in love with an unsuitable man. There are great similarities between Dorlcote, The Mill on the Floss, and George Eliot's childhood home at Griff. At the time she was writing this novel, Isaac had become so disgusted by his sister's marriage that as head of the family he had made it impossible for her to even visit the area, perhaps heightening her appreciation of Nuneaton and the surrounding countryside. However, because the plot required a tidal river, she spent some time searching for a setting for Maggie and Tom Tulliver to play out her own experiences with Isaac. In September 1859, George Lewis wrote this letter to Blackwood, describing a mill they had found in Lincolnshire, Gainsborough being the inspiration for the novel's town of St Ogg's. G.E. is in high spirits, having found a mill and mill stream to our heart's content, and we're going to hire a labourer's cottage for a day or two and live a poetical, primitive life, the results of which will appear in Maggie, who, by the way, becomes more fascinating than ever, and Tom more intensely boyish. There's a good deal of nostalgia in George Eliot's representation of childhood, but from a very early stage, there's a strong feeling of impending doom. For example, the feud that develops between Maggie and Tom's father and the lawyer Wakeham can be nothing but destructive. Mr Tulliver's inflexibility blinds him to what is really happening around him and results in the loss of the mill. Tom also shares his father's inflexibility, particularly in his relationship with Maggie, whom he prefers to judge and blame rather than try to understand. One of the major factors is Maggie's natural intelligence, misplaced in a society which concentrated on educating boys. Tom is sent to school, but because of his limited mental capacity, it's rather wasted, particularly when the reader recognises that it would have been better bestowed upon Maggie.
school is also the place where on a visit to Tom, Maggie meets lawyer Wakeham's son, the gentle, artistic, but crippled Philip, the complete antithesis of her brother, with whom she falls in love. Later, when Tom discovers their relationship, he forbids Maggie to see Philip again, forcing her to do his bidding. In this extract, Maggie is very angry, and there's a hint that Marion is talking directly to Isaac. Don't suppose that I think you are right, Tom, or that I bow to your will. You've been reproaching other people all your life. You've always been sure you yourself are right. It is because you have not a mind large enough to see that there is anything better than your own conduct and your own petty aims. Despite the great dramatic moments in The Mill on the Floss, there are also considerably more humorous interludes than to be found in Adam Bede. The Dodson sisters provide much of it, one of whom is Mrs Tulliver. They were actually based on George Eliot's mother, Christiana, and her sisters, quite well known in the Nuneaton area as the Pearsons, a family of some local standing. As the story concludes with Maggie making yet another disastrous liaison with her cousin Lucy's fiancé Stephen Guest, Tom becomes completely estranged from her, assuming the worst of his sister. Maggie realises her error and refuses to marry Stephen, but Tom will not relent. She becomes increasingly isolated and it takes the natural disaster of the flood to force a reconciliation between the two of them. As brother and sister become tragically united in death, the conclusion of the novel never ceases to shock the reader, even if it has been suggested that George Eliot had no choice but to let Maggie die, as there was nowhere else for the story to go in Victorian England. The Mill on the Floss was another great success, making life in London for the Lewis household very comfortable. They moved to 16 Blandford Square, with George Eliot's growing literary reputation bringing visits from other great writers, including Browning, Trollope and Wilkie Collins. The autobiographical element of The Mill on the Floss, once completed, allowed George Eliot to relax a little. It was almost as if she had exorcised her demons, letting her next novel become light relief by comparison to the epic story of Maggie and Tom. Silas Marner, published in 1861, is an affectionate but unsentimental portrait of rural life, again much influenced by George Eliot's Midlands childhood. There's an almost folk tale like quality to the story of the linen weaver of Ravelo. The setting is a village on the brink of the Industrial Revolution, an issue which George Eliot returns to in her later novels. Circumstances force Silas into isolation, making him withdrawn and concerned only with his work and golden guineas. When his money is stolen, he is distraught, hoping that someday he may get his money back. Shortly afterwards, one New Year's Eve, the money is replaced by a beautiful child who totters into Silas's cottage out of the snow. George Eliot's ability to touch the emotions of her readers is never more evident than when Silas mistakes the sleeping child for his lost gold. Gold! His own gold brought back to him as mysteriously as it had been taken away. He felt his heart begin to beat violently and for a few moments he was unable to stretch out his hand and grasp the restored treasure. The heap of gold seemed to glow and get larger beneath his agitated gaze. He leaned forward at last and stretched forth his hand. But instead of the hard coin with the familiar resisting outline, his fingers encountered soft, warm curls. In utter amazement, Silas fell on his knees and bent his head low to examine the marvel. It was a sleeping child, a round, fair thing with soft yellow rings all over its head. The life of Silas Marner is restored by the love of the motherless child, whom he adopts. The presence of Dolly Winthrop, befriending Silas and telling him how to look after Eppie, has elements of comic genius. 
After many years, the gold is dramatically found and returned to Silas. But as the facts of the case emerge, Epi's real father, Godfrey Cass, reveals his identity and attempts to claim his daughter. To Silas, the prospective loss of Epi is terrible, and the gold means nothing by comparison. Silas allows Epi to choose her own future and is rewarded when she refuses to leave him. The story has a delightful ending. Epi marries Dolly's son Aaron and the young couple settle with Silas to live happily ever after. George Eliot described Silas Marner as a story of old-fashioned village life and it was said to have been the author's favourite novel. It proved to be equally popular with George Eliot's readers, bringing further prestige and affluence. In February 1862, an offer came from Smith, Elder & Co, publishers of The Cornhill Magazine, for the next novel. The sum of £10,000 was a huge sum of money, even by today's standards, particularly considering the complete change of style and subject matter that Romola exhibited. The story was set in Florence at the end of the 15th century, based on historical characters, including Machiavelli and Savonarola. Blackwood was aware of the Italian story in development, but wasn't prepared to match Smith Elder's offer. He predicted that the project would not be a success, not through bad feeling, but based on sound publishing sense. Blackwood was proved correct. Smith Elder & Co made a loss, even though George Eliot had taken only £7,000 to have Romola published in 14 instalments rather than 16. The novel was generally criticised for being overworked, but the heroine, Romola, who at the end of the story becomes liberated by the discovery of her duty in self-sacrifice, presents a theme that George Eliot explores more fully at a later date. Blackwood was always courteous to George Eliot, despite her defection to Smith Elder, which was rewarded when she returned to Blackwood's with Felix Holt, published in 1866. Abandoning her continental inspiration, George Eliot returned to England, and memories of political unrest which she witnessed in Nuneaton as a girl. The plot deals with corrupt electioneering in the 1830s, which in this novel results in a riot occasioning the imprisonment of the radical hero, Felix Holt. By this time, the Lewises had moved to the Priory, 21 North Bank, near Regent's Park. The drawing room was professionally decorated to receive the growing number of important visitors. They were still mostly male, because society in general still disapproved of the literary couple's failure to marry. Felix Holt is a complex novel, and George Eliot sought the advice of a barrister to help with her legal research. Of all her English novels, it's the least well known, and although F. R. Leavis saw a certain merit in it, Henry James found the whole plot clumsily artificial and declared that although it was intensely drawn, George Eliot was dramatically superfluous. This isn't to say Henry James didn't admire George Eliot, and in one of his letters, the young American paints a valuable portrait of her. To begin with, she is magnificently ugly, deliciously hideous. She has a low forehead, a dull grey eye, a vast pendulous nose, a mouth full of uneven teeth, and a chin and jawbone qui n'en finissent pas. Now, in this vast ugliness, there is a powerful beauty, so that you end as I ended, falling in love with this great horse-faced blue stocking. Blackwood was disappointed with Felix Holt, 
then the next novel which George Eliot was to produce would definitely make up for it. Middlemarch, published in 1871, saw George Eliot at the pinnacle of her career and is arguably one of the best crafted novels in existence. Returning to the theme of dutiful, self-sacrificing, intellectual young females, George Eliot introduces her readers to Dorothea Brooke. Dorothea is one of literature's truly great heroines, and right from the beginning of the novel, the reader is overwhelmed by her idealism and almost puritanical goodness, which makes her rather difficult to like. But as disillusionment and life's disappointments mellow her through the course of the story, she grows into a delightfully strong, free-thinking, yet feminine woman whose character is admirable. While still in her teens, Dorothea marries a man 27 years her senior, as she believes that he will be her intellectual and spiritual guide assuming, as Mr. Cosorban would have expected, that his age and experience made him superior. I should not wish to have a husband very near my own age, said Dorothea, with grave decision. I should wish to have a husband who was above me in judgment and in all knowledge. Unfortunately, even while still on honeymoon, Dorothea discovers that Mr. Cosorban has more ego than intellect. Dorothea's self-realization humbles and softens her, and she seeks comfort in the friendship of Will Ladislaw, her husband's cousin. There is no impropriety, but Ladislaw falls in love with Dorothea, and as the increasingly unpleasant Kasorban suspects her partiality, he meanly adds a codicil to his will by which she will forfeit her fortune should she marry Ladislaw after Kasorban's death. Dorothea has no idea about this, only discovering it when Kasorban dies. The strength she has developed dutifully bearing her unhappy marriage helps her to stand firm in her love for Ladislaw, rejecting wealth and property in order to marry him. The good townsfolk of Middlemarch are fascinatingly well drawn by George Eliot, and she skillfully holds a multitude of subplots. The political electioneering seen in Felix Holt is again to be found in Middlemarch, and as the independent radical for the parliamentary candidature is Dorothea's uncle, the indecisive Mr Brooke, there are some gentle touches of comic irony. Also, George Eliot, with her more mature understanding of human nature, introduces what was a shocking revelation at that time, the details of a disintegrating marriage. Dr Tertius Lydgate is weak when it comes to his wife Rosamond's beauty, and as a result of providing the elegant lifestyle she requires, they've gone into debt. The episode where he explains this to her and asks for her cooperation so that they may fight the problem together is painful to read, and the depth of feeling that George Eliot exposes in her characters is raw. After appreciating Rosamond's beauty, Lydgate imparts the terrible news as gently as he possibly can but her selfish reaction instantly irritates him. What can I do, Tertius? said Rosamond, turning her eyes on him again. That little speech of four words, like so many others in all languages, is capable by varied vocal inflections of expressing all states of mind from helpless dimness to exhaustive argumentative perception. From the completest self-devoting fellowship to the most neutral aloofness, Rosamond's thin utterance threw into the words, What can I do? As much neutrality as they could hold, they fell like a mortal chill on Lydgate's roused tenderness. The argument that follows shows the couple ranged against each other, Lydgate cruel, Rosamond tearful and defiant. She refuses to take any responsibility for what has happened as the doomed Lydgate watches helplessly, recognising the irrevocable damage their relationship is suffering. To many women, the look Lydgate cast at her would have been more terrible than one of anger. It had in it a despairing acceptance 
of the distance she was placing between them. The backdrop of Middlemarch as a changing town is actually based upon George Eliot's own recollections of Coventry. It was not only the country towns that were transformed by the Industrial Revolution. The whole of society was touched at every level and this perhaps explains why Middlemarch grew into such a huge novel. Originally it was published in episodes and readers were impatient for each new instalment. This was deeply satisfying for George Eliot and it brought the literary couple greater prosperity than ever. Society finally seemed to accept her union with Lewis and at about this time they met a young man called John Walter Cross who became their financial advisor. Both were fond of Cross, calling him Nephew Johnny. The last novel that George Eliot wrote, Daniel Deronda, published in 1876, presents an amazing view into the future. Having become friendly with Emmanuel Deutsch, a Jewish scholar, George Eliot became fascinated by the plight of the Jews. As a character, Daniel Deronda himself owes much to Prime Minister Disraeli, elected to office in 1874. George Eliot had read Disraeli's novel, Tancred, which he didn't particularly admire. But it introduced to her the idea of Jewish pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which in turn became a strong motivational factor, influencing Deronda when he discovers his Jewish origins. Disraeli, despite being a Jew, had become fully assimilated into Victorian society and with his beautiful country house at Hewenden, had become accepted as a classically English gentleman. As a heroine, Daniel Deronda's selfish and gloriously spoiled Gwendolyn Harleth is the complete opposite of Dorothea Brooke in Middlemarch. Deronda first sets eyes upon her at a gaming table and the vision is spectacular, with Miss Harleth commanding his attention. George Eliot had encountered Byron's grand-niece playing at the gaming tables of Homburg and this description from one of her letters suggests that this incident was her source of inspiration. Miss Lee, Byron's grandniece, is only 26 years old and is completely in the grasp of this mean, money-making demon. It made me cry to see her young, fresh face among the hags and brutally stupid men around her. Confident and contemptuous in her assured beauty, Gwendolyn marries the appalling but rich Grand Court to save herself and her family from poverty. When warned by his lover, Lydia Glasher, and mother of his illegitimate children not to marry him, Gwendolyn thinks her own need greater than Mrs. Glasher's. The marriage is unhappy, and when Grand Court dies, Gwendolyn turns to Deronda for consolation. Earlier in the novel, Deronda saved a young Jewess, Myra, from committing suicide. The incident is dramatically recorded by George Eliot, echoing a suicide attempt made by Mary Wollstonecroft, an earlier campaigner for the rights of women. Presently she seated herself and deliberately dipped the cloak in the water, holding it there a little while, then taking it out with effort, rising from her seat as she did so. By this time, Deronda felt sure that she meant to wrap the wet cloak around her as a drowning shroud. There was no longer time to hesitate about frightening her. He rose and seized his oar to ply across, happily her position below him. The poor thing, overcome with terror at this sign of discovery from the opposite bank, sank down on the bank again, holding her cloak but half out of the water. Having saved Myra, Deronda attempts to reunite her with Jewish relatives in England and becomes fascinated when he discovers the Jewish community in London. When Deronda later learns that he is also of Jewish blood, he decides to marry Myra rather than the widowed Gwendolyn. As a novel, Daniel Deronda was less liked than Middlemarch, but the earlier instalments were equally as popular because the Jewish element didn't come into the storyline until a third of the way through. 
It's interesting to note that as the Jewish theme grew, the popularity of the installments decreased. Nevertheless, the powerful message discrediting anti-Semitism, almost foretelling the horrors of the Holocaust to come, was very well respected. In 1878, George Lewis developed cancer, dying in London on the 30th of November that year at the age of 61. George Eliot was grief-stricken and unable to leave her room at the Priory, not even strong enough to attend Lewis's funeral at Highgate Cemetery. Slowly, the woman who was now as much Lewis's widow as she had been his wife started to venture out. John Cross helped her with financial affairs and legal arrangements, but their relationship started to develop. All through George Eliot's life, she had possessed a charm and attraction that drew male admirers, despite her forbidding appearance. Nevertheless, George Eliot was disappointed with her looks, describing herself as a hideous hag and haggard as an old witch. It's interesting to note that many of the pretty females in her novels come to very sad ends. Poor Hetty Sorrel, who suffers tragically, is eventually replaced in Adam Bede's heart by plain, moral and, in the author's view, infinitely superior Dinah Morris. Conventionally feminine Lucy in The Mill on the Floss loses her fiancé Stephen to the more unusual charms of Maggie Tulliver. George Eliot is even harder on her beautiful creation, Gwendolyn Harleth, entering her into marriage as a form of prostitution. In Middlemarch, the lovely Rosamond with her troubled life is a very effective contrast to the beautifully spiritual Dorothea, making her shine even more brightly with morality and goodness. Whatever the nature of George Eliot's attraction, it didn't diminish with age, because at the age of 60, she married nephew Johnny, becoming Mrs. John Cross at St. George's, Hanover Square, on the 6th of May, 1880. Cross, who was 20 years her junior, had some kind of mental breakdown on honeymoon. This became evident when he jumped from a balcony into the Grand Canal in Venice. Fortunately, he was rescued by a passing gondolier, but this unpredictable behaviour was very worrying for his new wife. George Eliot's own health deteriorated as she became thin and suffered terribly with painful kidney stones. Despite this, Mr and Mrs Cross moved into the very stylish Four Cheney Walk in Chelsea in early December 1880. Two weeks later, just before Christmas, George Eliot became ill with a sore throat. Laryngitis was diagnosed, but instead of recovering as expected, her condition worsened and she became increasingly weak. When she died, peacefully drifting off to sleep at about 10 o'clock in the evening on the 22nd of December 1880, it came as a terrible shock to all who had known her. Dr. Andrew Clark, who attended her on the day of her death, noted her pericardium to be seriously affected, which would suggest that heart failure had been the underlying problem. John Cross was holding his wife's hands as she quietly passed away, which must have been comforting end for a lady who had needed the loving companionship of others for support throughout her life and works. George Eliot was 61 years old, the same age that George Lewis had been when he died. Cross, with the support of Herbert Spencer, tried to have his famous wife buried in Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey, but the religious establishment felt that her years living in sin with George Lewis precluded it. Instead, on the 29th of December 1880, George Eliot was buried next to her beloved George Lewis in unconsecrated ground at Highgate Cemetery. 
it was a bitterly cold day, but many distinguished people from all walks of life attended. One of the mourners was Isaac Evans, who had acknowledged his sister's marriage with a short note that had delighted her. Perhaps if she'd lived longer in her newfound respectability, brother and sister might have been reunited in the beautiful Midlands countryside of George Eliot's youth, so fondly remembered and immortalised in her magnificent writing. In a landscape that had so rapidly altered with the growth of the industrialization, it's impossible to imagine what she would have made of 30 years of change. Some of George Eliot's finest writing is full of the wistful longing of an exile carved from the fondness of memory, unspoiled by grown-up reality. This beautiful extract from Middlemarch is a fine epitaph for the girl from the Midlands who took London and the entire literary world by storm. Little details gave each field a particular physiognomy, dear to the eyes that have looked on them from childhood. The pool in the corner where the grasses were dank and the trees leaned whisperingly. The great oak shadowing a bare place in mid-pasture. The high bank where the ash trees grew. The sudden slope of the old mar pit making a red background for the burdock. The huddled roofs and ricks of the homestead without a traceable way of approach. The grey gate and fences against the depths of the bordering wood. And the stray hovel, its old, old thatch full of mossy hills and valleys with wondrous modulations of light and shadow, such as we travel far to see in later life and see larger, but not more beautiful. These are the things that make the gamut of joy in landscape to Midland-bred souls. The things they toddled among, or perhaps learned by heart standing between their father's knees while he drove leisurely. <laughs>